Good morning, brothers and sisters. Another privilege to be able to bring the word of God to my fellow spiritual family and to those online that might either watch live or one day in the future, you never know, our views go up and they're going to say, man, that James, he really takes a long time in expounding on two verses, but it's for the, it's for the glory of God. And I, I'm, I want to do this to honor my Lord and to be edifying to all. So as we will be reading from Romans chapter 8, we'll, read, we'll start reading from verse 12 and finish on verse 15, and I will be expounding on verses 14 and 15. So if you may rise for the reading of the word of God, again, that's Romans chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 12 and finish off in verse 15. And the inspired word of God reads, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Let's pray. Abba, Father, we come before you. You are our God. You are our Lord and our Master, our Savior. Yet you are also our Father, the one that we come to. Lord, you wipe away tears, you comfort, and you give peace. And this Lord's Day, we come to you as a family, as the children, to give you thanks, to give you honor, and to worship your name. Please, Lord, bless this time that we have set aside for you, Lord. Make it holy, consecrate it, for it is all for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, so not only are we halfway through the book of Romans, but we're almost halfway through the chapter 8. Because if I, I've said before, and I think our pastor also has said that the next three chapters are really the controversial ones. And a little bit of chapter eight, especially at the end, is extremely controversial because in the church, there has been many different beliefs on, does God save you 100% or does he leave that little 1% for us? To make that decision. So later on we will be talking and expounding on that. But here what we're seeing is that we have been adopted into the family of God. This is not a club. This is not a sorority. This is a family. That means that we have a father. And he's a good father. As the song says, you're a good, good father. But we also have a father that demands honor and respect. So when we are led by the Spirit, as verse 14 says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. I mean, we've been speaking about what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? If I were to ask you, what does it mean to be led by the Spirit? We might get different answers. But what does the Scripture say? If you see Romans chapter 8, the same chapter, just the verse before that we read earlier. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
So being led by the Spirit presupposes that you are being sanctified and you are putting to death your sins, your evil inclinations. You are a new creation. That's scripture. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. But also, as in chapter 7, Paul speaks about how we are in a war with the flesh. We are in war with what has not been recreated. Our flesh has not been recreated. Our flesh is not a new creation. Our spirit, our soul is. So to be led by the spirit is pretty much to be under the government of the spirit. This refers to a constant and effective, that is a fruitful influence of the Holy Spirit in regulating the thoughts, feelings, and conduct of believers. We are to have the fruits of the Spirit. We are to love our neighbor. We are to love our enemies, which seems like an impossible task. We can think of our enemies as just those people that disagree with us. But when somebody wants to kill you, when somebody wants to hurt you, when somebody wants to hurt your family, can you love them? Is that something that we can do? I will say that I, I've never been to that point where somebody wants to kill me that I know of. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know how I would react to that. Maybe some of you have. And um, maybe you could enlighten me on that feeling. But I would almost guarantee that I would not love them right at the beginning. I would have to really pray to the Lord and ask for him to give me that loving spirit. That when my enemy who wants to kill me is in a ditch and can get out, would I help them out? Would I give them food? Would I give them whatever it is that they need to keep them alive because we value life as Christians, as the children of God. So when we're putting those deeds of the body to death, which one of them is hate, what does Jesus say in Mark 7, verses 20 to 23? And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. I think he's talking about me. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Do we want to defile our bodies? Or do we want to give our bodies to the Lord, the temple of the Holy Spirit? We need to put these deeds to death. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is a pretty long list. This world actually celebrates some of these. The adversary, whether it's Satan, or whether it's, again, an enemy, the world system, pretty much every government in this, in this earth, celebrate a lot of these. I mean, we all know sexual immorality pretty much from the 60s on, has been kind of a staple of our culture. Oh, no, you, you guys can't get married until you've lived together for a few years, just so you know that this is the right person. Wait, you're marrying somebody you've never, you know, you've never consummated? I don't want to use the word because there's children around, but we know what it is. Oh, no, you can't do that. What if you don't like it? What if it's not satisfying? That's not how we live. 
We live by the word of God, and the word of God says sexual immorality outside of everything. So it's only with your spouse. Again, spouse presupposes you're married already. Paul makes mention of this in Romans 6, 12 through 13 in terms of the deeds of the body. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, that is your limbs, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So what are we supposed to use our body for? For righteousness. We were put on this earth to worship our God. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. We were not put on this planet to uh, become president. And that's the only thing. To become a, a CEO of a big company. To be a social media influencer. That is not the end goal. Now, could God have put us on this earth to be a social media influencer to bring people to him? Of course. But we're talking about the ultimate the finality, again, the chief end of man. We are here to serve God. And I, that's why I love from that catechism, and enjoy him forever. Enjoy God. Putting these deeds to death, although it's hard and it's a war zone, it's to enjoy God. It should not be something that we hate doing. In one sense, yes, we hate it because we have sin in our, in us, and we don't. We want to do that sin, but then at the same time, in the opposite sense, we want to glorify God because we love Him. Now, this leading or being led by the Spirit, it's a language that is to remind us of Israel in the Exodus and in in the wilderness, which I think from everything that I've read and looked into is really the background of what Paul is speaking about. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 6. Now, if you we read this, and you're not getting the picture of what God is commanding us to do, and again, we're not saying that we perfectly do this. What we're saying is that this is what we're commanded to do. And as Augustine said, help me with what you have commanded me. Help me to be able to do this. This is what we're called to do. So let's ask the Lord. And I know this is directly to Israel, but we're seeing that language. You know, sometimes we, we reference things, we reference them knowing that, yeah, that's supposed to be to that, but we're using those principles or, or those commands as, as a, uh, not only a reminder, but to teach. So let's he, see here. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 6. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. Right, that famous phrase. But, oh, I lost my place. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God.
by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Notice how it says in verse 3, to make you know, and also that the word comes from the mouth of the Lord. These are important things. We are not putting the deeds of the flesh and we are not going by a standard that we have no access to, that we can't point to people that is that changes. No, we're pointing to the words that come from the mouth of the Lord, which is scripture, God-breathed scripture. And if you notice in verse 5, it says, as, man, as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. disciplines his son. How do we know we're the sons of God? One of them is that God disciplines us. He convicts our heart when we do wrong. For verse 14 in chapter 8, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Later on, I'm going to speak a little bit about why the term sons of God is used in the literal sense, what it literally says in the Greek. Because we know translations change it up. But for right now, let's focus on sons of God. God here is speaking about, in the context of what we're going to read about in Hosea, he's speaking about mercy on Judah and denying mercy to Israel, right? Because we're going to say that Israel was a son of God. But there was a split in Israel. So let's read Hosea 1.10. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it will be that in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. As Paul says, we are the sons of God. We want to look and use the Bible, the analogy of faith. We interpret scripture with scripture. What does he mean, sons of God? There is a son of God who came down and died for my sins. What do you mean, sons of God? Job speaks about sons of God. Many, which I think I agree with, believe that those are angels so what do you mean we are sons of God Hosea speaking about Israel you are the sons of God of the living God and he's also speaking about somebody that is called you are not my people what does that mean as we will see not only later in, in the sermon series in chapter 9 of Romans but I will quote it here Romans chapter 9, verse 8, and verse 24 through 26. Here Paul is saying, This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Who are the children of the promise? What is the promise? The promise is that what was given to Abraham. As it further elaborates, verse 24 even us whom he has called, notice how he says, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, now we're going to see what, he, what it says, which we read. Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. We are the sons of the living God. Wait, but Hosea was speaking about Israel. What is Paul telling us? Inspired by the Holy Spirit. That he was speaking of the children of promise, which is faith. Those that have the faith of Abraham, 
which is not just physical juice. It is spiritual juice. We have the faith of Abraham. We are sons of the living God. We don't even have to use the term true Jews or grafted into Israel, which we do use. We are sons of the living God. We are his children. As John states in chapter 1, verse 12 of the Gospel of John, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How is that not comforting? We are the children of God. If you have the faith of Abraham, if you have received him and believed in his name, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, that's beautiful. Let me read this quote from Charles Hodge in his commentary on this book. This is an important point that I want to make here. By regeneration or new birth, they are born into a higher life, are made partakers, as the Apostle Peter says, of the divine nature, and are thus through and in Christ the source of their new life, the object, objects of the divine love, and the heirs of his kingdom. You see, we are dead in our spiritual sense. We cannot come to Christ because we can't. We just can't do it. We are so depraved, we are so in our sin that we are dead. So what does it take? It takes a rebirth, a regeneration, and when you're reborn, you are not born again to then say to God, sorry, I reject you again. You are born into his family. You are born because God has done it and he has said, you are mine. And because of that, we are heirs of his kingdom, which our pastor will speak on next week and elaborate more on that. We are the inheritors because we share in the inheritance with Christ, the Son of God, capital S. Now, verse 15 begins with, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So again, as I said, we are reborn. We are not reborn to then say, sorry God, I reject you once again, which just by that comment is presupposing that God exists, but we know it's, it's not said that way, just exactly, but no, I don't want anything to do with God, sorry. I don't want to abide by your rules. I don't fear you, I don't love you, this and that, impossible. Jesus says, he draws those to him. So what is this spirit of slavery? What does that mean? Let's look at a few verses. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So we have not received this spirit of the world. Just like Paul says, we have not received the spirit of slavery. Okay, again, it doesn't really give us much except that the world has this spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God gave us a spirit not of fear, now here he's going to elaborate more, but of power and love and self-control. All right, so this spirit of slavery, this spirit of the world, does not have power, does not have love, 
and does not have self-control. Okay? What does that mean? When we, are Christ, when, we, when we are not Christians, when we are unbelievers, do we have self-control to not sin? No. Everything we do is sin. When it's not being done to the Lord, it's sinful. That, does, that even means when you do, in human sense, good, it's a sin. It's filthy rags to the Lord. Because it's not done to glorify Him. It's got to be both. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And loving your neighbor as yourself. It can't just be love your neighbor and not love God. And when you love God with all your heart, you love your neighbor. It's a, it's a necessary consequence. So you see love and self-control. Power. You have the power to resist the devil, to resist you, the, the enemy of sin that is within you to resist your old self. You are not powerless. You have the Holy Spirit. John states in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You have the spirit of slavery that falls back into fear. What fear? When you're an unbeliever, do you have any fear that you are not doing what God says? You don't care. But there is this guilt in you. There is this fear that you're not doing right somehow. That you will be punished for your sin because there is a just God. See, you suppress that knowledge. You don't even realize that you're suppressing the truth as Paul spoke about in Romans chapter one. God is so holy, we see his works, we know he exists and we suppress it. So we know that we have to pay for being unholy, even if it's just a subconscious. Perfect love casts out that fear of punishment from God. We are no longer afraid to be punished because we have already received righteousness from God and the declaration that says, you are my son, you are my child, and Jesus Christ has taken that punishment. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not to have no fear that we should be abiding and obeying God. And also, the, the scripture speaks about the word fear when it says fear God, as in having respect for our God. Like, I fear my father. When I was a young boy, I feared my father, or my, really my mother, actually, more. Because if I, knew, if I did something wrong, I knew I was going to get punished. I was going to get disciplined. I knew it. My mom was harsh, but harsh in a good way, to a certain extent. <laughs> I'm not going to give her all the credit. I'm going to be a little prideful. Oh, wait, I'm sinning. My bad. Okay, so to finish off that section, I'm going to read another quote. This is by Joseph Fitzmeyer. I think this succinctly puts everything together and teaches us what this means of the spirit of slavery and falling back into fear. Christians have received the spirit of Christ or of God, but this is not a spirit in the sense of a disposition or mentality that a slave would have, which would connote anxiety and fear of a master. The attitude that Paul has described in chapter 7, as we go back in chapter 7, it's a different type of fear. Animated rather by God's spirit, Christians cannot have an attitude of slavery for the spirit sets one free. Christians have thereby won out over the anxiety of death and the fear of slavery. Paul does not indeed speak, sorry, Paul does indeed speak at times of Christians as slaves, but that is a way of expressing their relations to the risen Christ as curios, 
which is Lord or Master. So yes, we are slaves of Christ, but it is not a slavery of fear. It is a slavery of love towards our God. Continuing on in verse 15 of chapter 8. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. So again, I'm going to speak a little bit of what, why sons? And here, pretty much for the first time, we are seeing the, the word or the phrasing adoption as sons. Or adopted. Douglas Moo, in his commentary on Romans, speaks about where did this term of adoption, or not so much the term, but this idea of adoption come from. The legal act of adoption was not practiced by the Jews. So almost certainly Paul uses the image of the Greco-Roman practice whereby a man could formally confer on a child all the legal rights of a birth child. That's very important right there. This, Paul suggests, is what God's spirit confers on every believer. The rights and privileges of God's own children. We are given the status of God's child, God's children. We don't deserve it. But by his free, beautiful, merciful grace, he has adopted us. And what is he adopting us into? What, what family? Who did this belong to? As Paul will speak about in Romans chapter 9, verse 4, but we're just going to quickly go through it. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. So two things here. The Israelites are the ones who to them belong that adoption. But the nation as a whole rejected the Son of God, rejected the true child of God, the true Son of God, and thought, hey, we are, it's us, we are the Son of God as a corporate sense. What did God do? Two times he exiled the Jews. First, into Babylon, where they were slaves to Nebuchadnezzar. And then once again, after this, when they were exiled into all the nations by the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD. In the Bible, it does speak about, God speaks about it as a divorce. That's harsh language. But we need to remember something. As we read earlier in Hosea and in Romans, not all Israel is Israel. It's the children of the promise. There has always been a remnant within Israel that are the true sons of God. And now we are seeing that we are being grafted into this. We are coming together with the true sons of Israel. Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 23, speaks about adoption in a little bit of a different way. Let's read it. It says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly. Notice how it says we wait. 
eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Wait, I thought we were adopted already. Doesn't it say that we are adopted? Now here it's saying we are waiting for the adoption. How can that be? Can we fully be adopted soul and body at this point in time right now? No, we can't. Why? Because only our soul, our spirit has been given new birth. But our body is still waiting. It's still waiting for the redemption. So we are adopted into the family of God spiritually, but physically we are still eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. Sorry, full critters. Hasn't happened yet. This is why the, the terms and the verses, excuse me, <coughs> the verses are important. This is why the wording is important. We need to know that we are adopted now, but then our bodies, our physical bodies, which will be glorified, which will be redeemed, that is still waiting for an adoption, which will happen. We have the guarantee because we have the seal of the Holy Spirit within us. And Paul, speaking in Galatians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is really important right here. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So biblically speaking here, in the fullness of time, which is the fullness of the prophetic time of Jesus Christ, of his coming. The word son is used. This is why it used, it's important that the translations translate what the wording actually says. And it is our job to either explain it as the clergy or to do our research. Sons of God is to remind us that the son, the word son, is used to symbolize or represent our common status like God's son. See how important that is? If it says children of God, which is still true, it doesn't remind us that we are sharing in the same status as the son of God, not in his deity, in his inheritance. Many, many uh, uh, verses in the Bible, they will say sons or they will say brothers. You know, and the new, the new modern translations want to say, hey, well, we got to include everybody. So we're going to say children and we're going to say brothers and sisters or this and that. I mean, let's be real here. When we say the word mankind, it means male and female. It's not, we're not being sexist. That's just how it is. So here, sons of God is sons and daughters, the children. But it is meant to represent and symbolize our status that God's son has, that we are sharing in. And you notice how in verse 7 of Galatians, it says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We don't have slavery anymore, except for some countries out there in the Middle East and maybe in the South Pacific. But at this time, they did. And what was a common practice? 
the slaves, even the children of the slaves, they don't have access to everything that the actual children of the master has. They weren't allowed to participate in certain things. I mean, I don't know the specifics. I wasn't there. <laughs> but they couldn't just share in everything. They couldn't say, oh, you know what? The, the, the children of my slave is also going to share in the inheritance of my son and my daughter. That's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. Unfortunate as that is. What is Paul telling us here? That we are no longer those slaves that don't have that inheritance that is not for us, right? That we don't deserve. We're actually like the children. We are the children of the master who has now given us his inheritance. See, for us it's tough to understand that. But back then, that was amazing. That was almost incomprehensible. Why? Why? That doesn't happen. That is the love and the mercy of God that we need to remember because we speak about the love and the mercy of God and sometimes we just mention it and we know it and we believe it but we don't really think about it. We don't really understand it. It doesn't make us rejoice the same as it did when we first found out about it. We deserve nothing. And God has says, you have the inheritance. You have the kingdom. You share with my son. And that's why we cry, Abba, Father. The last phrasing of verse 15 by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We can't cry, declare, say that if God is not our Father. People will say it and they don't realize what they're saying and they're actually bringing about more judgment on themselves. We cry, Abba, Father, because we are no longer that slave that has no inheritance. Instead, we are sons of the living God. And as you see, it says, by whom? Who is this whom? The power of the Spirit. This is what proves our adoption because we are able to cry this genuinely and truthfully, Abba, Father. So as we saw in Galatians, Paul references this Abba Father. Galatians was most likely written before Romans. It's said to be one of his earlier epistles. The first Thessalonians, Galatians, and one more. I can't remember the other one. So Romans is really going back to that citing in Galatians, which is Galatians 4, 6, which we read earlier. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. But let me ask you a question. And I'm, I know some of you will know this. When have we seen that cry, Abba, Father, before? Our Lord Jesus Christ who is the true Son of God, the heir. In Mark 14, 36, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Is that our prayer? Do we say to God, God, I need that promotion. I will not accept no as an answer. Oh, heck no. Let's never say that. It's not what I will, but what you will. 
Sometimes we don't like the answer. But he is our God. And he is our Father. Abba, Father. Abba is Aramaic, which was the language that they spoke during the first century. The Jews did anyway. And Father is the Greek. Obviously for us it's in English. So you think to yourself, they're speaking Aramaic. Jesus was speaking Aramaic. So he didn't say Father. But what is Mark telling us? It's the inclusion of the Gentiles. It's Abba, Father, Jews, Gentiles. That we can cry, because most of us here are Gentiles. We can cry and declare our God, Abba, Father, my God, my Father, Dad. When I would ask my dad for stuff, I'd say, Dad, please, I really need that money for this or that. Mom, I need you. I messed up. Abba, Father, sanctify me. May your will be done. So what is our application for daily practice? I have three points. First point, are you led by the Holy Spirit? And as we spoke about, one of the aspects of being led by the Holy Spirit is are you putting the deeds of your body to death? Are you mortifying your sin? Are you casting off whatever is making you sin so that you can please and glorify God? I mean, we've, chapter 6 and 7, it was very adamant about that. And even a little bit of chapter 8. We are to be led by the Holy Spirit. Kill the flesh. And what does that mean? That doesn't actually mean kill your body. It means get rid of those things that make you sin against the Lord. Do what you can to glorify God to abide by his law very easily accessible law Exodus 20 just go to it love the Lord your God it's even summed up even easier for us by the Lord Jesus Christ which he's really referencing Old Testament text love the Lord your God with all your heart your soul your mind and your strength with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. You're not to love your neighbor so you say, you know what, that's wrong but since I love you anyway, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. No. You rebuke. You tell them, no, don't do that. That's not loving the Lord which was told to me many times and I said, eh. And now I look back and I'm ashamed second point is the cry Abba Father your type of relationship with excuse me <coughs> with God <coughs> please examine yourselves do you have a relationship with God where you go to him. When, 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 your ch when your children are very young, they, they need you for almost absolutely everything. They don't need you to breathe unless obviously something's in, in, in their way, but they need you for everything. Do you need God for everything? Let me tell you, you do. You don't even know it. We breathe because God has made our bodies to breathe without us even thinking about it. My heart beats and pumps blood. I never agreed to that. God did that for me. 
I need God for everything. That includes small things that we would think, no, I'm not going to go to God for that. I used to think like that. No, I'm not going to ask God for me to pass that test. Dude, like, why do I need it? I don't need to bother God with that. Really? How about asking God to keep you honest when you're taking that test? To not cheat, to do things right, and to do it for the glory of God. We need God for that. Is that your relationship with God where you say, Dad, please help me? Dad, I need you. Third point and final point. Is your adoption into the family of God only a declaration? Do you say or do you believe that you're adopted into the family of God and neglect the family of God? Do you punch your clock in Sunday morning and after the service you punch it and forget about the family of God? Or are we a spiritual family that loves God together and worships Him daily? Yes, I know we don't meet together daily. But we have relationships. We're brothers and sisters. I know people that talk to their actual physical siblings every day. I don't do that either. I need to start doing that. I need to start doing that with my parents. So this is also self-examination to myself. Do we love the family of God? You're adopted into a family. You're not adopted into a club. You're not adopted into a sorority. You're not adopted into a whatever else you want to put in there. It's a family. We love each other. I think we almost all of us have relationships here in some form or another. Another question that I've spoken with with uh, Brother Allen, how many churches, how many members of big churches can actually say, oh yeah, I talk to my pastor all the time. I have lunch with him or I talk to him on the phone or I know his kids or how many can say that? How many of the millions, well, maybe it's not millions, maybe of the tens of thousands that go to Joel Osteen's church actually know Joel Osteen personally. We are a family. We're not just looking up at somebody speaking and saying, wow, he speaks so well. Okay, see you later. We are a family of God. Look how Paul speaks to the Thessalonian church. 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Why do you think we give the announcements? We want you to participate with us, to worship God with us. We are not lone wolves. We are not lone Christians that go out into the world to be attacked by a pack of wolves. We are in a family. And it is a godly family where our Father is the God of this universe. And that's why we cry, Abba, Father, together. May it be for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, there's no other way to say it. We love you. We come together to express our love to you and to worship you. We have no longer fear of punishment in the ultimate sense. Because you lead us with your spirit that now gives us the power to worship you in spirit and in truth. We come together as a family and we cry to you, Dad, Abba Father, work in us so that we can actually love you with everything we have. 
that we can love our neighbor truthfully and not deceive ourselves into thinking that we love them just because we have some little emotion in them. We have actions that we are to do. We are to abide by your law. You are the God of this universe and you will forever, ever be the lawgiver, the provider, the one that gives us everything. And we cling to you because of the mercy that you've shown us. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your servant, Paul, that has written this letter to a specific church, but yet you have allowed us to read it and meditate and research and study and love you through it. For we've gained so much from who at one time was an enemy of the church and a persecutor, and you regenerated him and made him a son of the living God, just as you've done with us. <coughs> May yours be the power, the kingdom, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.